Take your Bibles, please. Turn, turn to Third John. Third John. I know some of you probably could have guessed. After First John, after Second John, we would then start Third John. I try to keep it simple. Try to keep it simple. Third <laughs> um, John has one chapter. It has 14 verses. It has 294 words. Third uh, John is the shortest book in the Bible by number of words. Second John was the shortest book in the Bible by number of verses. Third John's the shortest by number of words. Um, the main theme of the book is truth, truth. In 14 verses, the word truth is found six times. The main, uh, main theme is truth. Um, the interesting thing about 3 John is, uh, to me is you really don't hear a whole lot of preaching out of 3 John. Um, I've, been, I've been in church since nine months before I was born, and um, I really don't remember... I really don't remember, I could have missed it, I honestly can't recall a time ever hearing a, a full sermon out of 3 John uh, in my life. Um, I've heard it referenced occasionally, but it's a, it's a pretty neglected book, and I, I don't even really know why, I can't really give you a real reason, but not a whole lot of people uh, preach out of 3 John, but um, it's, uh, it's necessary, it's part of the Word of God. And um, there's uh, it's inter- another thing that's interesting about it. It's the only book in the Bible that is a third. There's lots of seconds. There's Second Samuel. There's Second Kings. There's Second Chronicles. In the New Testament, you got Second Corinthians, Second Thessalonians, Second Timothy, Second Peter. Of course, Second John. But uh, this is the only third in the Bible. It's the only third of anything. Third John. And here's what I find interesting is that in the only book in the Bible that the Lord decided to put a third one on it, a third John, he did it and he emphasized truth. Truth is the theme of this epistle. And it just shows you the value that God places on truth. When God decided to write a third, he emphasized truth. Truth. So let's... um. Let's just read the, uh, the, whole, the whole book here um, and get the, uh, the whole context, the whole book, see what it's about. Uh, 3 John, verse number 1, it says, The elder unto the well-beloved Gaius, whom I love in the truth. Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prospereth. For I rejoice greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee, even as thou walkest in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth. Beloved, thou doest faithfully whatsoever thou doest to the brethren and to strangers, which have borne witness of thy charity before the church, whom if thou bring forward on their journey after a godly sort, thou shalt do well, because that for his name's sake they went forth, taking nothing of the Gentiles." We therefore ought to receive such that we might be fellow helpers to the truth. I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes, who loveth to have the preeminence among them, receiveth as not. Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds which he doeth, prating against us with malicious words and not content therewith. Neither doth he himself receive the brethren, and forbiddeth them that would, and casteth them out of the church. Beloved, Follow not that which is evil, but that which is good. He that doeth good is of God, but he that doeth evil hath not seen God. Demetrius hath good report of all men, and of the truth itself. Yea, and we also bear record, and ye know that our record is true. I had many things to write, but I will not with ink and pen write unto thee, but I trust I shall shortly see thee, and we shall speak face to face. Peace be to thee, our friends salute thee, greet the friends by name. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for the Bible. 
Thank you for this book of 3 John in particular. And uh, I do uh, pray that uh, you would help me to speak the truth uh, accurately, help me to uh, uh, accurately represent you and speak the truth in love that we all might be helped and we all might be uh, given what you have for us uh, this morning. Pray that we would receive it uh, uh, with a proper heart, proper mind. And Lord, may Jesus Christ alone uh, be exalted and magnified for he alone is worthy uh, t- uh, to have that. And um, Lord, I have nothing in and of myself uh, to offer these people. You know that, and I know that, and I'm sure they know that too. They need to hear from you, and uh, I pray that uh, you would use me uh, this morning uh, to deliver your truth, and we would all be helped by it. Lord, if there's anyone in our midst uh, that doesn't know you as their Savior, I pray that today would be the day when they trust you as their Savior for the salvation of their sins. Uh, from their sins. And Lord, for those of us that are saved, help us, Lord, in regards to this matter of the truth, uh, to acknowledge it, to obey it, be more like Jesus Christ and more in line with the Word of God. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So this morning's, uh, this morning's sermon, we're going to talk about truth. Truth. That is the main theme of this epistle. It's used six times. Truth is found in verse 1. It's found twice in verse 3. It's found in verse 4, verse 8, and verse 12. It is the main theme of this book. Uh, John uh, is used, uh, he emphasizes it a lot in everything he wrote. Uh, the Gospel of John, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, talks about uh, truth a lot. And um, there's two sources of truth. Two sources of truth in this world. Uh, It's Jesus Christ and the Word of God. All right, so John 14, 6, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And then in John 17, 17 says, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And I would say to you this morning that the most important issue of all the issues that you could talk about is the issue of the Word of God. Because, you say, even more than Jesus, well, here's why I say that. Without the Word of God, you don't know who Jesus is. Because the Islam has a Jesus. Islam actually speaks good things about Jesus. Uh, they don't say he's a bad person. They say he's a good man. They just don't say he's God manifest in the flesh. They just didn't, they don't say he, he died, was buried, and rose again the third day. Uh, Mormons and Jehovah Witnesses, and, and, and they speak good things about Jesus. And they will even use the terminology uh, of, of Jesus is my Savior. They don't mean it like you mean it, and that I mean it, but they'll use some of the same terminology. They'll say good things about Jesus. So But you have to open the Word of God, the Holy Bible, to know who exactly is Jesus Christ. He is God manifest in the flesh. So the main issue of all the issues is the Word of God. Because everything we believe, including who Jesus Christ is himself, comes from the Word of God. So um, look with me at uh, verse number 1 here. It says, The elder unto the well-beloved Gaius... Whom I love in the truth. Your love has to be in accord with truth. Otherwise, it's not real love. It's not biblical love. It's perverted love. It's misguided love. But love must be in accord with the truth. Now, one thing I want to bring up to you this morning before we really get going is uh, this... 3 John, John starts it almost the exact same way as he starts 2 John. 3 John 1 says, The elder unto the well-beloved Gaius, whom I love in the truth. Look at 2 John, verse number 1. The elder unto the elect lady and her children, whom I love in the truth. So, he starts 2 John the same way as he starts 3 John. When he writes to the elect lady, he says, whom I love in the truth. When he writes to Gaius, he says, whom I love in the truth. And here's my point for this morning. When John wrote to a lady, and when he wrote to a man, when he wrote to a sister in Christ, and when he wrote to a brother in Christ, he gave them the exact same greeting. 
And what I would say to us men is that if you address the sisters in Christ in a different way than you would address the brothers in Christ, not that we don't believe there's a difference between men and women, we absolutely do believe that. You're not whoever you want to be, you're not who you wish you were, you're not who you think you are, you are whoever God made you. But if you have a different vocabulary for the ladies than you do for the men, if you have one way of expressing your love for the sisters and a different way of love, a different way of expressing your love for the brothers, you're not being loving, you're being carnal. You're in the flesh. And John wrote to the elect lady and he says, I love you in the truth. And that's the exact same, that, that's the exact same thing he said to the, to the man, to Gaius. He says, I love you in the truth. So there's nothing wrong with expressing your love to all the saints. Just make sure you're being consistent. Make sure your conversation is holy and righteous. And there's nothing, there's nothing you can pick apart in anything John said to the lady because he said the exact same thing to the man in 3 John. Now, let's run some verses on, on this matter of truth. Go back to Genesis chapter 32. Genesis chapter 32. Look at what the Bible says, not everything, it's, it's quite a vast subject, but some of the things the Bible says about truth. Genesis chapter 32, verse number 9. And Jacob said, O God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, the Lord which saidst unto me, return unto thy country and to thy kindred, and I will deal well with thee. I am not worthy of the least of all the mercies and of all the truth which thou hast showed unto thy servant. For with my staff I passed over this Jordan, and now I am become two bands. You know what Jacob said? I'm not worthy of the least of all the mercies, that's true, but also the least of all the truth which thou showed unto thy servant. You know what Jacob says? I am not worthy of the least amount of truth you've shown me, Lord. And what a, what a, great, what a great truth, what a great acknowledgement, what a great thing to say that any truth that God has ever showed us, we are not worthy of. How many times, how many times in your life has God showed you some truth? either from you reading the Bible or from you hearing it preached or from a brother or a sister bringing it to your attention. Here's the truth. And you acknowledged it. And you said it was right. And you said it was true. And you agreed. Yes, that is the truth. And you did absolutely nothing with it. And you didn't take one step towards putting it into practice in your life. I'm telling you, it's God's mercy that He ever gave us truth again. We are not worthy to receive the least amount of truth. How many times has God shown you truth from the Word of God and you delayed and you put it off and you said, when I have a convenient season, maybe one day I'll apply that to my life. It's, it, you're not worthy. It's only because of God's compassion and His love for you that He ever taught you that again, that He ever gave you any truth again. How many times did you, have you ever gotten stirred in a church service to some action or to some way of thinking or, or way of being, and that's all it was? You got stirred in a church service, and it never amounted to anything. It's only God's mercy He ever gave us any truth again, <laughs> because He gave us truth, and we did nothing with it. He gave us truth, and we put it off. He gave us truth, we acknowledged it, we saw it, and we didn't put it into practice. We're not worthy of the least of the truth that God has given us. My question to you this morning is, when God shows you truth from the Bible, is that a big deal to you? Is it no big deal that God would show you truth? Is it no big deal when God would show you something from His Bible? Is, is, that, is that not a big deal? You should get as much knowledge as you possibly can. You should get as much truth as you possibly can. But it should never make us puffed up because we don't deserve any of it. Whatever truth you've received, whatever truth I've received, we're not worthy to receive it. We're not worthy to have it. 
You know what Jacob says? I'm not worthy of the least of all the truth that you've shown to me. Should be, you should be thankful for the truth. Every time God opens your mind, every time God opens your heart, every time he shows you something that you never saw before, every time he, he teaches you his word, that should be cause for rejoicing and praise. Thank you, Lord. You just gave me something that I'm not worthy of. Should be a big deal. Go to Genesis chapter 42. Genesis chapter 42. Joseph is speaking with his brethren, but his brethren don't know it's Joseph yet. And, you know, as you read through it, it does, see, it does seem that Joseph's kind of enjoying the moment. I mean, he's kind of, he's kind of dragging it on. He's not going to tell them right away who he is. He's, I mean, he's, he is relishing the moment just a little bit as he sees them uh, squirm. But uh, look at Genesis chapter 42. Look at verse 13. Genesis 42, 13, And they said, Thy servants are twelve brethren, the sons of one man in the land of Canaan. And behold, the youngest is this day with our father, and one is not. And Joseph said unto them, That it is that I spake unto you, saying, Ye are spies. See, he's toying with them. Joseph knows they're not spies. But he says, No, you're spies. Verse 15, Hereby ye shall be proved. By the life of Pharaoh, ye shall not go forth hence, except your youngest brother come hither. Send one of you, and let him fetch your brother, and ye shall be kept in prison. That your words may be proved, whether there be any truth in you. Or else by the life of Pharaoh, surely ye are spies. So, Joseph's brethren come to Joseph. And Joseph asks them about their family, and he asks them about their lives and about their state and where they come from and all that. And they give them the story. Hey, we, we got a younger brother. He's still at home. One is not, but he's standing right in front of them, but they don't know that. But we have a brother who's, who's at home. He's too little. He didn't come with us. And Joseph says, okay, stop right here. I'm going to find out right now whether or not you said the truth, and I'm going to hold you captive until your words can be verified, and and, until I find out if there's any truth in you. Now, what if next time you told a story about someone, what if that person had the power to hold you captive until he verified what you had to say was right or not? (laughs) What if the next time you said, made some claim about yourself and your own greatness, if the person you were talking to had, had the power to say, you're not leaving my presence until someone goes and checks the, the truth and the verity of what you're saying. I guarantee you, we'd all be a little bit more careful in what we said. <laughs> but we don't worry about it because the people we talk to don't have that power. But, you know, one day... You're going to stand before the Lord, and he's going to give, you're going to give an account, and every idle word that you've spoken, we're going to give an account of in the day of judgment. And one day, we are going to stand before the Lord, and, and we are going to stand before someone who's powerful enough to hold us accountable for what we've said and to find out whether or not what we said was right. And I would say it's a, it's a really, it would be a really good perspective on uh, our daily conversation and the way we interact with people if we had the mindset of, okay, it, the person I'm telling this story to right now, the person I'm speaking to right now, if they had the power to hold me captive until they verified my story, would I change my story or would I keep on saying what I'm saying? And Joseph said, you're going to stay right here until I can verify what you've said and find out if there's any truth in you. We really ought to be more careful in what we say. We really ought to, uh, really ought to, have, the ad, ad, ought to have the attitude of, I really, be able to, I really ought to be truthful in everything I say and make sure what I say, were it to be investigated, were it to be examined, would it to be checked out, it would check out. Find out whether or not there's any truth in us. Look at Exodus chapter 18. Exodus chapter 18. Just 
just a fun Bible study on different things the Lord says about truth. Exodus chapter 18, look at verse 17. And Moses' father-in-law said unto him, The thing that thou doest is not good. Thou wilt surely wear away both thou and this people that is with thee. For this thing is too heavy for thee. Thou art not able to perform it thyself alone. Hearken now unto my voice, I will give thee counsel, and God shall be with thee. Be thou uh, for the people to God were, that thou mayest bring the causes unto God, and thou shalt teach them ordinances and laws, and shalt show them the way wherein they must walk, and the work that they must do. Moreover, thou shalt provide out of all the people able men, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness, and place such over them to be rulers of thousands and rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties and rulers of tens. So, Moses' father-in-law looks out at this great congregation, which we don't know the exact number. It could easily have been a couple million or more people. And he says, you know, you can't handle this by yourself. A couple million people, you're going to need some help. So why don't you find some, some other people that will help you in, in judging, and, and you can set them over them, and, and the hard matters they'll bring to you, but other things they'll take care of themselves. But you can't just pick anyone. There's some qualifications they have to meet, and one of those qualifications is men of truth. Men of truth. And I would say that if you want God to use you in any place of leadership at all, if you want God to put you there, you're going to have to be a man, a man or a woman of truth. Because if, it's, if something is wrong, it's wrong no matter who did it. If something is wrong, it's wrong if your friend did it, or your family did it, or your, or your family member did it. If it's wrong, it's wrong. If it's right, if it's right. And if you're going to be entrusted with judgment, with leadership, you have to make sure that what is important and what the priority is, is the truth. A lot of people say they want truth until it touches their family and touches their friends, and then all of a sudden they don't, they don't put a great of a value on the truth. God says, if you want me to put you in leadership, you have to be a man of truth. A man of truth. None of us are above the truth. You're not above the truth. I'm not above the truth. What has to be the priority is the truth. Otherwise, we're just the hypocrites that so many, so many people accuse us to be. What's important is the truth. The truth. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 12 and John chapter 4. 1 Samuel chapter 12 and John chapter 4. First Samuel 12. Verse number 20, uh, 22. Starting for 22, 1 Samuel 12, 22. For the Lord will, will not forsake his people for his great namesake, because it hath pleased the Lord to make you his people. Moreover, as for me, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you. But I will teach you the good and the right way. Only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart. For consider how great things he hath done for you. With that, John 4 Verse 24, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. All right, so you're supposed to worship him in spirit, but that's not what we're talking about this morning. We're talking about in truth. You know what the Bible says? You're supposed to worship him in truth. You're supposed to serve him in truth. So I don't want to, God forbid, I should dampen anyone's zeal to serve the Lord or do anything for the Lord. I'm more than happy, and more importantly, the Lord is more than happy to receive your service. But your service and your worship has to be in accord with truth, has to be done in truth. And it's like when someone says they want to join the army and they want to help out in the war, the day they enlist, he's not helping out in the war effort. 
The day he says, I will and I swear, they're not sending him overseas. First thing first, you go through basic training. After your basic training is accomplished, then you go to some school to learn your job. Uh, in other words, that's great that you want to help with the war. That's great that you want to fight, but you don't know what you're doing. You need some training first. And it's great that you want to do this and do that and serve the Lord. And, and, and I would say we need more of it. And I would, never, uh, I would never dampen anyone's zeal. But what I would say, what the Lord would say is, it needs to be done in truth. Learn your Bible. Make sure you're not just serving me any way you feel like it. Make sure it's being done in accord with the truth. He wants your service, but He wants your service to be right in accord with the Word of God. You can't just do something religious and say and call it serving God. You've got, it's got to be in line with the Word of God. Serve Him in truth. Worship Him in truth. All right, 2 Chronicles chapter 18. 2 Chronicles chapter 18. Verse number 3, 2 Chronicles 18, 3. And Ahab, he's a bad guy. <laughs> and Ahab, king of Israel, said unto Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, Wilt thou go with me to Ramoth-Gilead? And he answered him, I am as thou art, and my people as thy people, and we will be with thee in the war. And Jehoshaphat said unto the king of Israel, Inquire, I pray thee, at the word of the Lord today which is what he said, he should have said that before I'm with you, and before I'll be with you in the war, but he said it after. In other words, I'm already made up my mind what I'm going to do, but hopefully the Lord will second it and back it up. Uh, verse number five, Therefore the king of Israel gathered together of prophets, 400 men, and said unto them, Shall we go to Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall, shall I forbear? And they said, Go up, for God will deliver it into the king's hand. But Jehoshaphat said, Is there not here a prophet of the Lord, besides that we might inquire of him? And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, There is yet one man by whom we may inquire of the Lord, but I hate him. For he never prophesied good unto me, but always evil. Every time it's the same thing. You need to repent. You need to get right. The same is Micaiah, the son of Imla. And Jehoshaphat said, Let not the king say so. Now, you know what the king of Israel said? I hate him. Now, it's not a matter of whether or not what he's saying is true. Not a matter of what he's saying is right. It's, it, it's not good. It's always evil. It's always negative. It's always against me. Never mind the truth. It's against me. Verse 8, And the king of Israel called for one of his officers and said, Fetch quickly Micaiah, the son of Imla. And the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, sat either of them on his throne, clothed in their robes, and they sat in a void place at the entering in of the gate of Samaria. And all the prophets prophesied before them. And Zedekiah, the son of Chenana, had made him horns of iron, and said, Thus saith the Lord, with these thou shalt push Syria until they be consumed. And all the prophets prophesied so, saying, Go up to Ramoth Gilead and prosper, for the Lord shall deliver it into the hand of the king." And the messenger that went to call Micaiah spake to him, saying, Behold, the words of the prophets declare good, not what's true, not what's right. They declare good to the king with one assent. Let thy word, therefore, I pray thee, be like one of theirs, and speak thou good. And Micaiah said, As the Lord liveth, even what my God saith, that will I speak. And when he was come to the king, the king said unto him, Micaiah, Shall we go to Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall I forbear? And he said, Go ye up and prosper, and they shall be delivered into your hand. Now, I don't know if this is a moment of me a weakness on Micaiah's part. Personally, I think it's some sarcasm, because he knows the king's not really interested in what he's asking for. And he doesn't say, the Lord said it. He just said, go ye up and prosper. <laughs> he doesn't say, thus saith the Lord. He says, go up and prosper, everything will be great. And the king knows he's not being sincere, because look at verse 15. And the king said to him, How many times shall I adjure thee that thou say nothing but the truth to me in the name of the Lord? Well, that's, that sounds nice in theory, but 
not really what most people want. You know, he said, I've told you time and time again, I want the truth. You don't tell me anything but the truth. Yeah, we'll see if he really means it. Verse 16, then he said, I did see all Israel scattered upon the mountains, the sheep that have no shepherd. And the Lord said, these have no master. Let them return, therefore, every man to his house in peace. And the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, Did I not tell thee that he would, prophesy, he would not prophesy good unto me, but evil? You know what he said? I told you he wasn't going to prophesy good. I told you it would be negative. I told you if you brought this man, it would be a negative message. It would be against what I want to do. I told you that. But I thought you wanted the truth. I thought you told him, don't say anything but the truth. I, I thought you said, how many times do I have to tell you, don't give me anything but the truth. And that's so typical. That's so typical. You know what people say they want? They say they want the truth. You, I want, I want a place where I can hear the truth. I want someone who's going to preach the truth. I want someone who's going to tell me the truth until they get it. Until it crosses what they want to do, until it crosses what they think, then all of a sudden they're not interested in the truth. Now they're interested in what's positive and what's good and what sounds nice. See, there's, there's theory and then there's what, where the rubber meets the road. In theory, people say, I want the truth. In theory, people say, I want to hear the truth. Until they're confronted with what the truth actually says... And then many times they're really not all in on the truth. Verse number 18. Again he said, Therefore hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting upon his throne and all the host of heaven standing on his right hand and on his left. And the Lord said, Who shall entice Ahab, king of Israel, that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? And one spake, saying after this manner, and another saying after that manner, then there came out a spirit and stood before the Lord and said, I will entice him. And the Lord said unto him, Wherewith? And he said, I will go out and, and be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And the Lord said, Thou shalt entice him, and thou shalt also prevail. Go out and do even so. Now therefore, behold, the Lord hath put a lying spirit in the mouth of these thy prophets. And the Lord hath spoken evil against thee. You know, People complain all the time about liars. I'm tired of fake people. I'm tired of liars. I'm tired of insincere people. I'm tired of people who won't be straight. But when God gives them the truth, they don't want it. When God gives them the truth, they reject it. Well, then you're going to get more liars. And you're going to get more falsehood. You're going to get more deceit. Because when God showed you the, the truth, you didn't want the truth. Ahab said, don't give me anything but the truth. And he got the truth, and he didn't like it. So the Lord... Give him a lying spirit. Here, you don't want the truth? Well, here's a lie, because that's what you want. The Lord's a gentleman. He'll give you what you want. <laughs> if you don't want the truth, he's not going to force it on you. He'll let you believe a lie. Go with me to Psalm 15. Psalm 15. The Lord is watching your heart. He, the Lord looketh on the heart. You know what? He's, he's watching a lot of things. You know what, one of the things he's watching? When he looks on your heart, and my heart too, he's watching how you respond to truth. He's watching how you respond when truth runs contrary to the way you think or the way you want to live. He's watching it. He's watching how you respond to the truth. And if you demonstrate that despite what you say, you're not really interested in the truth, He's not obligated to give you any more truth. Look at Psalm 15. Psalm 15, verse number 1. Lord, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who, who shall dwell in thy holy hill? He that walketh uprightly and worketh righteousness and speaketh the truth in his heart. Now that's harder than it seems on the surface. Because that's honestly one of the hardest places to speak the truth in your own heart. Because that requires acknowledging at times, I am wrong. I have been wrong. 
I am currently wrong. The way I'm thinking about this is wrong. The way I'm doing this is wrong. When the Lord, through His Holy Spirit, through His Word, confronts you with a truth and calls you out like He does with every one of us and says, this is you, like Nathan to David, thou art the man. How do you respond? Now, David had plenty of sins and plenty of faults, but when he was called out, he acknowledged it. You know the difference, I, I, I think I've said this before, you know the difference between Saul and David? They both committed some pretty bad sins. I mean, I mean we, we kind of look at David as a good guy and Saul as a bad guy. Here's the di- but they both, both did some bad things. Here's the difference between them. When Saul was confronted with his sin, he said, it's the people. Remember, 1 Samuel 15, uh, what, Samuel comes to him and said, What meaneth then this bleeding of the sheep? God told you to destroy it all. Oh, the people. Oh, we were going to sacrifice to the Lord. Oh, it's their fault. When David was confronted about his sin, he said, You got me. You got me. And the Lord's watching how you respond to truth. He's watching when he calls you out. In your sin, in your heart, your heart, you have to be willing to acknowledge it and say, I am wrong. You know, we're not supposed to confess our sins to each other. We confess our faults to each other so we can pray. But you don't, it would be a bad idea to actually confess specific sins one to another. But we are supposed to confess them to the Lord. 1 John 1, 9, if we... Uh, 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 I can't even remember it now. First John 1 John 1.9, we confess our sins to the Lord. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we do take our sins to the Lord for the purpose of Him helping and, and cleansing us from all unrighteousness so He can help us get the victory. But here's the thing. If you won't acknowledge it, well, then you're not going to confess it. And then guess what? You're cutting yourself off from the victory that could be yours. The Lord doesn't point it out to just make you feel bad. He points it out so you'll get it right. And you can get beyond it. And you can get help and you can get victory. But if you won't speak the truth in your heart, if you won't acknowledge, if you won't confess, then you're never going to have victory. It is hard. Come on, isn't it hard sometimes to admit we're wrong about something? I mean, it's hard. It re- it's hard. It's hard. But it's much harder to just keep on going failing for the rest of your life. It's easier to acknowledge it, just admit it. He he knows it anyways. It's not like if you deny it, he's going to be fooled. (laughs) He's pointing it out so we will realize it. You can deny it all you want. The Lord still knows. (laughs) So you might as well just tell him. You're not going to confess more than, than what he knows. Oh, I just told him. I just told him I was wrong. Now he knows. He already knows. He's trying to help you. But you got to be honest with the Lord. Look at Psalm 96. Psalm 96. Verse number 12. Psalm 96, verse 12. Let the field be joyful, and all that is therein, then shall all the trees of the wood rejoice before the Lord. For he cometh, for he cometh to judge the earth. He shall judge the world with righteousness and the people with his truth. Not what you want the truth to be, with his truth. Folks, this is the standard by which we will be judged when we stand before the Lord. Why should anyone really have to poke you and prod you and get you to read and study the Bible? You're studying your, you're studying your own standard on Judgment Day. I mean, this is what you're going to be judged by. It shouldn't be a surprise. It shouldn't be a secret. Why would anyone have to convince you to read the standard by which you're going to be judged? He's going to judge you with his truth, not what mood he's in on that day, not how he's feeling. He's going to judge you with his truth. This is the standard on judgment day. 
If that doesn't motivate you to read and study your Bible, I, got, I really don't have much for you. I mean, that's your life and your judgment day and your rewards or your lack of rewards. <laughs> I don't know. Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7. Verse number 1, Daniel 7, verse number 1. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed. Then he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matters. Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of the heavens strove upon the great sea. And four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. I beheld till the wings thereof were plucked. And it was lifted up from the earth and made stand upon the, f- the feet as a man. And a man's heart was given to it. And behold, another beast, a second, like to a bear. And it raised up itself on one side and it had three ribs in the mouth of, in the mouth of it between the teeth of it. And they said thus unto it, Arise, devour much flesh. After this I beheld, and lo, another like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl. The beast had also four heads, and dominion was given to it. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, and strong exceedingly, and had great iron teeth, and it devoured and brake in pieces, and stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns." I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. All right, so that needs no explanation, right? It's all perfectly clear. Now, (laughs) we, we can get some of this because we've heard preaching on it before. Maybe we've read commentaries before. We've heard, it, or we've heard people talk about it and attempt to explain it before. But you realize when Daniel had this vision for the first time, you realize how clueless he must have been? I mean, he can't turn to Larkin's charts and find out something about it. He can't read a commentary. He, there's no preaching about it. I mean, he is getting this vision for the first time. You realize how, much, how clueless he must have to be after having a vision like this? Let's skip down to verse 15. I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit in the midst of my body, and the visions of my head troubled me. I bet they did. <laughs> After a vision dream like that. Verse 16. I came near unto one of them that stood by and what? Asked him the truth of all this. So he told me. And made me know the interpretation of the things. So Daniel gets this vision. Has absolutely no idea what's going on. So you know what he does? He asks. He asks the truth of all this. What does it mean? What's this about? You know, when you, <clears throat> when you read your Bible, when I read my Bible, you know, there's many things we come across that it's just like, I have no idea what that's talking about. It happens a lot in Zechariah. I have no idea what that's talking about. Uh, it's like, I, Lord, I don't know. I don't know. But here's my question to you. When that happens, when that happens, do you, just, you just throw up your hands and say, oh, it's no use. I can't understand the Bible. I'll never understand the Bible. Or do you go to the Lord and ask Him the truth? Lord, teach me. Lord, help me. I don't know what I'm reading. I don't know what this is talking about. Would you please teach me? Daniel got this vision. He had no idea what was going on. You know what he did? He asked, show me the truth of all this. You know what the Lord wants to know? Do you even care to find out? Do you even care to ask? Do you care to dig any deeper? Or you just keep on reading, shrug your shoulders and say, I guess I'll never understand that. How interested are you in the truth? How much do you want to know the truth? Daniel wanted to know the truth. He came across something he had no idea, but he asked, he wanted to know. What is your interest level in the truth? The Lord's watching that. Get Matthew 15 and Psalm 119. 
Matthew chapter 15 and Psalm 119. Matthew chapter 15, starting verse 21. Then Jesus went thence and departed into the coasts of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coasts and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with a devil. Now, this is serious. She's got a daughter devil possessed. She comes to Jesus. Right thing to do. Verse 23. But he answered her, not a word. Just ignores her. Well, it's probably not what she was hoping or expecting, but he just ignores her. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, send her away, for she crieth after us. But he answered and said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So first he ignores her, and then he says, why well, didn't come for you anyways? That sounds, that's pretty rough, isn't it? That sounds pretty harsh. Verse 25, then came she and worshipped him. Now, would that be your response if the Lord said that to you? <laughs> After he ignores you, says, I'm not sending for you. Would you respond by worshipping him? This lady, she's something special here. Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not meek to take the children's bread and to cast it to dogs. Wow! I mean, if you didn't get the first hint, if you didn't get the second hint, try this one. You're a dog. Would I take the children's bread and to give it to dogs? No. Then I wouldn't stop, then I wouldn't turn from Israel and try and heal your daughter. That is, that's something else. Verse 27, and she said, truth, Lord. Wow, what a response. Truth, Lord. Yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. <laughs> then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto thee even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. You know, this woman comes to Jesus and says, Hey, my daughter is devil-possessed. Would you please heal her? First he ignores her. And then he says, You know I'm not sent to you, right? And then he calls her a dog. And it's her daughter. And you know what she says? One of the most amazing statements in all the Bible, if you ask me. Truth, Lord. You know what she wasn't concerned with? She wasn't concerned with how her, his answer made her feel. She wasn't concerned with whether it was good or bad or nice. It was, is it true? Yes, it is. Anyone not from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is a Gentile. They are on the outside. They are dogs. That is absolutely true. You know what this woman loved? She loved truth. You know what she was concerned with? She was concerned with truth. Now look at Psalm 119. Psalm 119, verse 165. Great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing, nothing shall offend them. Now what a great example the Lord gave us in Matthew chapter 15. You say, well, does it really mean nothing? It really means nothing. Ask the woman in Matthew chapter 15. Jesus ignored her. He said, I'm not sent to you. Then he called her a dog. But you know what? She loved the truth. She was concerned with the truth. And she was not offended. Now, the Lord holds her out as an example to all the thin-skinned Christians today who get bent out of shape, they can't take a rebuke, they can't handle Bible preaching, they can't handle being corrected, they can't, hold, they can't handle being told they're wrong, and the Lord says, you see this woman? You see how I interacted with her? You see how she loved the truth because she loved it and she wanted the truth? 
This woman can handle a lot more than a lot of full-grown men can. <laughs> you know why? Because she's concerned with the truth. She loves the truth. You love the Word of God? Look, you read this Bible. It does not paint a very good picture of us in our natural state. It will, it, will, it will call you out. It will call your sins out. It not only will it call it your sins out, it will show you how low we really are for having done those sins. And you just need to remember this woman in Matthew chapter 15 who said, Truth, Lord. I mean, no matter what it is, if you're concerned with truth, it's, you're right, Lord. That is true. Now help me. Help me. Look at John chapter 18. John chapter 18. Whatever the Lord's called out in your life, you ought to be able to say, truth, Lord. Truth, Lord. John chapter 18. John chapter 18. Uh, let's just get the context here. Start in verse 33. Then Pilate entered into the judgment hall again and called Jesus and said unto him, Art thou the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Sayest thou this thing of thyself, or did others tell it thee of me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Thine own nation and the chief priests have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom's, kingdom were of this world... Then would my servants fight, that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom, not from hence. Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. Pilate saith unto him, What is truth? And when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews, and saith unto them, I find in him no fault at all. Now Pilate asked the right question. That is the right question. What is truth? However, here's his problem. He never stuck around for the answer. He said, what is truth? And as soon as he had said that, he doesn't stick around for the answer. He goes out and starts talking with the crowd again. Look at verse 39. But ye have a custom that I should release unto you one at the Passover. Will ye therefore that I release unto you the king of the Jews? It's good to ask for the truth, but the Lord wants to know how sincere are you. Some people give lip service to wanting the truth. They say they want the truth, but if they suspect that it's not really what they want to hear, they don't stick around for the answer and they don't listen. What is truth? That's the right question. But you got to stick around and listen. You got to hear it. You got to find out the answer. Pilate goes back out and, and reasons, tries to reason, tries to argue for Jesus, but. What are you reasoning for? You already, you already know there's no fault in him. You already found no fault in him. You already know he's telling the truth. It, what's there to argue about? What's there to reason about? The, the case should have been settled. I, I do kind of feel a little bad for Pilate as you read all the gospel accounts. I mean, he's, he's the pressure of Caesar and the crowd, and he, and he wants to release Jesus. But here's his problem right here. He didn't want the truth. He didn't want the truth. He says, what is truth? And then he walks away. you got to ask the Lord for truth, and then you got to stick it out and see what the answer is. You can't just ask the Lord for truth. you got to find out what it is. Stick around long enough to find out what the truth is. Look at Galatians chapter 4. If you walk away from what the Lord's trying to show you, it will be your destruction, just like Pilate. Whoso despiseth the word shall be destroyed, what Proverbs 13 says. Galatians chapter 4, verse number 16. Galatians 4, 16. Paul's writing to this church at Galatia who's gotten off on this error 
about how to keep their salvation, try to maintain their salvation, and trying to set them right. It says in Galatians 4.16, Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? They had made Paul out to be the enemy because they no longer wanted to listen, not to Paul, but to the truth. And here's the fact of the matter. Any minister, any preacher, all we are are messengers. I have no original thought to give you that didn't come from the Word of God. I have no message to tell you that didn't come out of the Bible. All we are is messengers, but when a Christian determines or decides that they no longer want to hear the truth, they no longer want to obey the truth, it's much easier to make the preacher the enemy than it is to admit I'm fighting against God. Because that takes a whole, nother, a whole nother level of rebellion farther on down the road to openly acknowledge in your heart, I am fighting against God's truth. It's much more easier to make the one telling you the truth, the enemy. It's much, much, it's much more easier to justify your rebellion if you make the messenger the enemy. And folks, I am nothing. I know that. I am nothing. I am absolutely nothing. I am just a messenger telling you what God said. And if God told you what, if God showed you the truth from His Word, then your problem is not with me. If I didn't preach it, the Bible would still say it. If I quit, it would still be true. Your problem is with the truth of the Word of God. Don't make the preacher the enemy because you don't want to hear the truth. Go to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Verse 25. Ephesians 4, 25. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. So speaking truth is more than just not lying because it says put away lying and then it says speak every man truth. We can come in here to church and we can talk about the weather and we can talk about the sport, sports, we can talk about politics and we wouldn't be lying but we're not speaking the truth. I want to hear what you learned from your Bible reading this week. I mean you always get to hear what I learned. I want to hear what you learned. I want to hear what God showed you. I want to hear what God taught you. I want to hear truth from your lips. When we get together, we're supposed to speak truth with each other. When you go, uh, go to work on your job site, there's a million things you could talk about, but you're supposed to bring the conversation eventually to the truth. Remember Jesus at the well in John chapter 4? Meets, meets that woman at the well. A million things he could have said to her that he wouldn't be lying but he chose to talk about talk to her about the truth chose to talk about her to talk to her about the salve the, the, her need for the salvation of her soul a lot of things he could have said that wouldn't be lying but what she needed was the truth what we need is the truth we're supposed to be speaking the truth that's more than just not lying that's we got something to talk about that's worth more than anything this world has to offer look at second timothy chapter 4 and we'll go back to 3 John. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Second Timothy chapter 4, verse number 1. I charge thee before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant, in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. The Lord warns you about the time when People are just not going to want to hear sound doctrine anymore. They're not going to want to hear the truth anymore. And I would say to you, we're there. 
I would say to you that we're there. I don't know when the Lord's coming, but, you know, um, Brother Knox said, um, he said in all his years of pastoring, which goes, which goes actually back to early 80s, he, this is the, the one he's pastoring now is not the first church he pastored, but all his years of pastoring, he said, of all the people that ever left his church, he said, only one person in all those years, 40 years, only one person was ever honest enough to tell him when they gave them the reason for leaving. We, you know what he said? He said, we just don't want to hear it anymore. In other words, you're not doing anything wrong. You're not preaching anything wrong. You're not saying you're giving us the truth. But we're just tired of hearing it. Because we don't want to live that way anymore. We don't want to be confronted. One man in 40 years was honest enough to say, that's why we're leaving. Most people, you never get the real reason. Most people, because if they, if they said it publicly, <laughs> they would realize how foolish it really was. But you know, the Lord warns you about a time when people won't endure sound doctrine anymore and their ears will be turned away from the truth. Don't get weary from hearing the truth. You only get weary of it when you're not doing it. When the Lord keeps telling you and you keep resisting it, that's when the weariness comes in. That's when the I'm tired of this comes in. If you would do it and if you would submit to it, the Lord would bless your life and you would want more of it. Don't get tired of the truth. Go back to 3 John. 3 John. Look at verse 3. For I rejoiced greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee, even as thou walkest in the truth. You see the order? First the truth has to be in you, and then you can walk in the truth. You can't walk in a way that you're ignorant of. You know what, you know what Psalm 119 verse 11 says, Thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. You, if you want to walk in the truth, praise God. First you've got to get it in you. You've got to hide it in your heart. You've got to read it every day. You've got to study it. You've got to dig into it. You have got to get the truth in you. And then you can walk in the truth. So, 3 John, 3 John, the main theme of the book is truth. And that's just a little bit about what God has to say about the truth. But the truth, the truth, it has to be, take priority. Over your feelings, my feelings, the truth, we all have to submit to the truth. If you want the Lord to bless your life, you want to finish this course with joy. Father, thank you for an opportunity to open up your word. Please help us with these truths. Help us to trust you enough to obey your truth. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.